the title, particularly the subtitle, Manufacture of Consent in a Democratic Society, is uh, a bit paradoxical. Uh, manufacture of consent refers to indoctrination, and indoctrination is inconsistent with a democratic society, so you can't have manufacture of consent in a democratic society. Uh, there's, in fact, a standard view on this matter which does make it inconsistent. The standard view is expressed, for example, by Supreme Court Justice Powell when he speaks of what he calls the societal purpose of the First Amendment, uh, enabling the public to assert meaningful control over uh, the political process. That's a pretty obvious idea. It, the idea is that a democracy functions to the extent that people have uh, free access to um, I, to information and opinion, and of course the opportunity to act on it. Uh, well, that sounds obvious, in fact perhaps almost tautological, uh, but it's worth bearing in mind that there is a contrary view, in fact a very well represented contrary view. In fact the contrary view is probably the dominant view among uh, uh, people who actually have written and thought about uh, the nature of modern democracy. And this contrary view can be traced right back to the origins of modern democracy in the 17th century English Revolution. Uh, as in the case of most revolutions, maybe virtually all, that was a multidimensional affair with a civil war between the supporters of the king and the supporters of parliament, but then a big popular movement was against all of them. Uh, and didn't want uh, and was trying to and had a very uh, populist, radical, democratic character to it and was defeated. The Democrats were defeated within about 20 years by 1660. And you read their pamphlets, they were saying that we've lost. The only question now is whose slaves the poor shall be, uh, king or parliament. Uh, many revolutions have the same consequence, uh, maybe all so far one yet to come. Uh, uh, in the course of that struggle, there was a great deal of concern over the fact that the general population was gaining the opportunity uh, and the, even the idea of becoming involved directly in shaping their own affairs. Uh, and that led to great concerns. Uh, John Locke wrote that day laborers and tradesmen uh, the spinsters and dairymaids must be told what to believe. Uh, the greatest part cannot know, and therefore they must believe. Uh, one of the contemporary historians, a man named Clement Walker, uh, wrote at the time that of uh, the deep concern of the liberal elements we're talking about now over the fact that uh, these guys with their little printing presses putting out pamphlets and you know agitating in the army and that sort of thing, uh, we're beginning to reveal the mysteries of government. Uh, and he said if they do that, uh, they will make people so curious and arrogant that they will never find humility enough to submit to a civil rule. That has to be stopped. Uh, and the same idea comes right up to the modern period. Without running through the American Revolution, you can find it and so on. In the modern period, uh, you find major thinkers picking up the same themes. For example, Reinhold Niebuhr, who's a much respected moralist and political thinker and very, very influential and among modern political leaders, uh, wrote that rationality belongs to the cool observers, uh, but because of the stupidity of the average man, he follows not reason but faith. And the naive faith of the proletarian requires necessary illusion and emotionally potent oversimplifications which have to be provided by myth makers to keep the ordinary person on the right course. Uh, Walter Lippmann, who was the Dean of American Journalists, uh, wrote about what he called the manufacture of consent. That's where that phrase comes from. And he said that the manufacture of consent has become a self-conscious art and a regular organ of popular government in a revolution in the practice of democracy. And this, he thought, was appropriate because the common interests very largely elude public opinion entirely and can be managed only by a specialized class whose personal interests reach beyond the locality. That would be Niebuhr's cool observers. Now that was right after World War I, and the timing is important 
During World War I, uh, John Dewey's circle of liberal intellectuals uh, were extremely impressed with, uh, in their words, in their perception, with having imposed their will upon a reluctant and indifferent majority uh, with the aid of propaganda fabrications about Hun atrocities and jingoistic uh, oversimplifications. The point was that, as usual, the population was pacifistic and didn't want to go to war. Didn't see any point in it. In fact, Woodrow Wilson won the 1916 election uh, on the slogan, uh, Peace Without Victory, uh, a mandate which he predictably interpreted as meaning victory without peace very quickly. Uh, and uh, with the aid of the intellectuals, they felt at least, maybe they were exaggerating their own contribution, that they had whipped the population into a war fever. Uh, and, uh, American uh, historians also joined enthusiastically in the cause. Uh, they formed the National Board for Historical Service. Uh, the founder of it uh, said that what was needed was what, what he called historical engineering, uh, a method to serve the state by explaining the issues of the war so that we might better win it. Uh, the Wilson administration established the first official government propaganda agency uh, in the United States called the Creel Commission, Commission on Public Information, which was a straight propaganda agency to try to uh, turn this reluctant and indifferent majority uh, into a willingness to uh, fight the war and succumb to jingoistic uh, fanaticism. That's actually a predecessor of a much more ambitious program uh, developed during the Reagan administration uh, the Reagan's Office of Latin American Public Diplomacy, theoretically under the State Department, but actually apparently run by the National Security Council. Uh, that was an illegal operation, uh, as the Congressional General Accounting Office later concluded in a study of it, a legal operation which had the intent of intimidating critics and uh, controlling a debate and discussion over Central America. Its goals, as they put it, were to demonize the Sandinistas uh, and, of course, to uh, build up support for the U.S. client states, the U.S. terror states in the region. Now, that was exposed during the Iran-Contra hearings by one of the very few journalists who actually uh, did some work on the hearings, did some journalistic work instead of just repeating the handouts. Uh, Alfonso Chardy of the Miami Herald exposed this, and when he exposed, began, expo later, came out a lot more details in congressional hearings. Uh, when he exposed it, he went to high administration officials to, who, to ask them to talk about it, and they described the, these propaganda efforts as a spectacular success. Uh, one of them described the efforts as the kind of operation that you would carry out in enemy territory. That's a very evocative phrase, and it expresses the attitude of the Reaganite uh, uh, political leaders, and in fact of state leaders generally, towards their own populations. They're an enemy. It's the domestic enemy that you have to control and marginalize. And you want to make sure that they don't become so curious and arrogant that they won't find humility enough to submit to a civil rule. Uh, the, uh, out of the uh, Creel Commission, but going back to World War I, there were a number of consequences. One of the members of the Creel Commission was a man who went on to become the leading figure and sort of patron saint of the modern public relations industry, uh, Edward Bernays. Uh, he later wrote about what he called the engineering of consent, which he said was the essence of democracy. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and the public relations industry is devoted, in the words of its own, to major industry, that, which was devoted to controlling what they call the public mind uh, educating the American people about the economic facts of life to ensure a favorable climate for business and a proper understanding of the common interests. Uh, the public mind, uh, one AT&T executive observed 80 years ago, the public mind is the only serious danger facing the company, and it's got to be controlled. Uh, Edward Bernays went on uh, to carry out such operations as demonizing the democratic capitalist government of Guatemala working for the United Fruit Company when the United States was planning to overthrow it, as it did in 1954, turning the country into a charnel house, which has remained ever since. Uh, there's also an academic twist to all of this. In fact, it's a major theme in the academic social sciences. Uh, going back at least 50 years or more, one of the most prominent modern American 
political scientist, Harold Laswell, who's a leading figure in uh, communications and such things. Uh, he wrote the article on propaganda in the International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences, which was published in 1933. Uh, and in it, he says that we should not succumb to democratic dogmatisms about men being the best judges of their own interests. They are not. Uh, the best judges are the elites, us smart guys, the cool observers. And we must therefore be ensured the means to impose our will for the common good, of course. This, he said, will require a whole te new technique of control, largely through propaganda, because of the ignorance and superstition of the masses. Same theme all the way through. Uh, the basic uh, problem is this. Uh, the idea is that if you have a society in which the voice of the people is heard, you've got to make sure that that voice says the right thing. In totalitarian societies, it's not a big problem. You've you got a club in your hand. Uh, and if people don't behave the right way, you hit them with a club or threaten them with it. So it doesn't really matter much what they think. What matters is what they do, and that you control by force. But as the capacity of the state to control by force erodes, it's necessary to control what people think. And in fact, I think you find much more sophisticated concern uh, for thought control precisely as the society becomes more free. I don't think it's surprising that the sophisticated discussion, uh, things like the public relations industry and uh, the academic uh, side of it and you know, the journalistic side and all these kinds of things I've been sampling, uh, I suspect if one did a comparative study, you'd find that they develop primarily in relatively free societies. Uh, ours is a very free society in the sense that the state has, by comparative standards, very limited resources to control by force. And I think it's undoubtedly, in fact, the most sophisticated in the terms of in the reliance on techniques of indoctrination and control, public relations industry in particular as a, an American creation.